Hi everybody, welcome to the next edition of Remote Sensing Lectures in Your Pajamas. And this time we're going to be getting into one more pre-processing step that is often necessary before we can actually use uh, imagery and that is a geometric correction. So essentially when our satellite or our sensor, even the airborne sensors, are gathering this reflectance information, they're not associating them with specific geographic coordinates. So we often will have to take some steps to get that raw pixelated data and put that into a format with information that allows us to understand where that lays in actual space on the Earth's surface. If you were to open a raw image that does not have any um, projection information associated with it yet, it would always just look like a nice square image. If you wanted to try to overlay this with another image, it wouldn't know how to do that because it doesn't know how those images are in relation to each other. And not only that, in reality, where those pixels lie on the ground is likely not a straight up and down perfectly square image. And that's why often you'll see these rows of missing data, these black pixels surrounding our image because once they actually have their geographic coordinates associated with them, it is very unlikely that there's still going to be this straight up and down perfectly square image. However, our digital image files are always perfectly square. There's always a given number of columns and a given number of rows and that makes them a square. Right? They'd be a rectangle, so they're always rectangular and they still have to be rectangular even after we apply a geometric correction. And so what we end up doing is having to fill in those extra pixels that aren't associated with actual data with zero values around the outside of our image. With aerial imagery it gets even more interesting because the image is going to need to be corrected not just for exactly where it is over the landscape but you gotta remember that aircraft is moving there's this sort of um, back and forth wobble which is referred to as roll uh, planes especially if you've been on a smaller plane you've noticed that the nose is not always pointing directly forward sometimes the wind can push the plane so that the sensor is actually looking sideways at something or crooked and then there's also the pitch which is just is the nose up is the nose down all of these things are affecting what the sensor is actually seeing on the ground and any sensor that's mounted on an aircraft will have instrumentation within it that calculate the roll, pitch, and yaw for every single second that that sensor is recording imagery and we use that information as a very first step to do what we call an INS correction for aerial imagery. So that's something that's not required for satellite imagery, but it is a first step for our aerial imagery. And once you apply that INS correction for aerial imagery, you end up seeing something like this. The original RAW file would have just been a straight rectangle where every single pixel would have had a data value. But we've had to essentially do a geometric correction with the INS roll, pitch, and yaw information to figure out where that sensor was actually looking. And the more windy or the more turbulence an aircraft experiences, the more you see this distortion once you truly correct for um, this this roll pitch and yaw. So that roll pitch and yaw is simply corrected with an INS file that comes from um, whoever's providing the imagery and that literally is just taking that information from the instrument that measures roll pitch and yaw and linking that to the timestamp for each pixel that's acquired by the detector. But to actually then figure out where these pixels overlay on the ground, we have to do this geocorrection by identifying features in our image that we, and then linking those to some map that we know has uh, geographic coordinates associated with it already and essentially saying this is the same feature in my image as this location in the actual map that has coordinates and we're going to link that information to essentially pin down this map in the real world and real world, coord real world coordinates. I and mean, you can almost think of these as individual pins that are trying to take our, our square uh, image and rotate and stretch and warp it however it needs to happen to make these pins 
overlap. It becomes especially important to do this well. In other words, not just put it roughly in the right location, but make sure that we really have high accuracy um, for a lot of the analyses that we're going to do later on. So why do we have to go through this? Well, there are a couple of instances. Often, the information that you need to cover your landscape or your study area, uh, region of interest, can't be um, covered with just one image. Often, you need to get multiple passes of a satellite or multiple flight paths of an aircraft. And we need to be able to essentially stitch those different images together to give us one large picture of the entire landscape. So that's essentially mosaicing. And we can't mosaic these images until we know where they lie in space so that we know how to stitch them together. Um, also, if we're looking at time series, we have to be able to know exactly that we're looking at the same spot on the ground in each of those different time steps. Otherwise, you may see differences that aren't really related to temporal change at all. They're just because you're looking at different locations. Also, if we want to actually use this information uh, to inform management or field activities, we have to know where to send people People if we find something interesting within the imagery. So I already showed you how the motion of the platform can uh, lead to these distortions that have to be corrected in our imagery. So for example that aerial uh, image acquisition with the roll pitch and yaw. So one other source of distortion in our imagery is simply the motion of the Earth. Keep in mind that as our satellites are orbiting the planet, that the planet itself is actually rotating underneath of it. And what that ends up looking like is our uh, you know, raw file, that's this rectangular shape with a given number of columns and rows, ends up actually representing a different location on the ground as the satellite orbits because the Earth is turning underneath of that. So even though it's in the same orbit path, the spot that it recorded reflectance from, uh, you know, 10 seconds ago is slightly different than the spot that it's recording um, from now, just not only because it's moving in a southerly direction as it orbits, but because the Earth is actually rotating under that. When we have really large imagery, in other words, um, an image that, that covers a large swath of ground on the Earth's surface, is the Earth's curvature itself. And actually, all three of these, the Earth's curvature, um, the topography of the surface under the sensor, and also where the sensor is actually looking. Is it looking straight down or is it looking off to the side? These distortions, distortions are all related to the same thing, and that is the distance from the sensor to the surface. So when you think about the Earth's curvature, if you have a sensor looking straight down, right at that nadir view, that straight down view, every one of those pixels or each detector that's recording reflectance is going to see or going to cover a certain area on the ground. But as you move off to the side and further away from nadir, especially if you're talking about a really large landscape, the Earth's curvature is actually going to pull that land surface farther away from the sensor. The topographic relief is the same way. Any detector that is recording the reflectance from a mountainous region, that mountainous surface is going to be closer to the sensor than the valley floor. And so what that means is that every detector in a mountainous region is going to be gathering the reflectance from a smaller area on the ground because that focal view of each detector doesn't change but the farther you get from the detector the larger the area on the ground each pixel represents so up here each individual pixel is actually recording reflectance for a smaller area on the ground actual area on the ground whereas down in the valley it's farther from the sensor and so each of these pixels actually records reflectance from a larger surface area and the impact of that what it makes things look like in our image is that in these mountainous regions the imagery looks like it's larger because more pixels are covering it because each individual pixel is representing a smaller uh, area on the on the ground whereas that exact same size object down at a lower elevation just because it's further from the sensor is going to be covered by fewer pixels because each individual pixel is covering a larger area on the ground and so objects are going to appear smaller there and so this is again something that we have to correct for 
and we can do just our traditional um, geographic correction to fix this topographic effect but there are also um, different tools that we can use that actually bring in digital elevation models so we can underlay the topography um, over the same location as our imagery and use that to refine even further um, how this image is draped across the landscape. And this process is referred to as ortho-rectifying or a terrain corrected. So when we were downloading our Landsat imagery, we were trying to get down to the processing level 1T, and that stands for a topographic correction or terrain correction included as a part of that geographic correction, the geometric correction. Another common source of distortions in our imagery is when we have sensors that are able to uh, collect imagery off nadir, or in other words, they're able to actually scan and look to the side to collect their imagery. They're not always just collecting right below themselves. And very similar to that topographic uh, distortion or the curvature of the earth distortion, it really is all about which part of the image that's being collected is closest to the sensor versus, versus which is farther. And if you are pointing for image acquisition off to the side, those pixels that are directly under the sensor are closer to the sensor. And so they're going to be representing actually a smaller area on the ground versus those ones that are farther away. That detector is picking up reflectance from a much larger area on the ground. And the effective impact is that the objects directly under the sensor are going to appear larger than the objects that are farther away. So that's a whole lot of sources of distortion in our imagery. How can we correct for it? Well, it's actually a two-step process. We already talked about how we're going to have just our straight uh, generic binary file that comes from the sensor with a certain number of columns and a certain number of rows. Well, the first thing that the software needs to do is just take each of these individual pixels and figure out how they need to be stretched or turned or twisted to make them match the landscape so that the coordinates for this pixel match the right spot on the ground. But it does this independently of the data that's actually stored inside each pixel. So the very first step is just actually imagine that you remove all of that information about reflectance for all of our bands and let's just figure out where our pixels should go. And then once we have that, once we have our pixels now located in the right area, we have to figure out which data values, which reflectance values from the original image go in to each of these different pixels. Because now that we've stretched and warped, we may have even a different number of columns and rows to cover that area properly. But we need to make sure that the right reflectance data gets into the correct pixel in this newly warped image. And then, of course, the final step would be to fill in just with missing data values all around this because we know that our final uh, file does have to be a given number of columns and a given number of rows. So we'll do these two steps one at a time. We'll first talk about just creating that transformation matrix. And that's always going to involve somehow finding locations in the original image. We call them tie points or ground control points. And linking them to a known location either on the ground or in some other image or map. So let's talk about those two different approaches. So we can do an image to ground geocorrection and for example that might include us going out and collecting ground control points um, with a Trimble or with a GPS and then I could put that information into my software and use that to tie down the image. So that's just image to ground. But we can also do image to image geocorrection which doesn't involve us having to go out and do any actual field work. Really, all that we have to do is find the same features in our image that we're trying to geocorrect and some other image or map that already has coordinates associated with it. And so we're going to use that map that already has the coordinates associated with it as a reference image and then we will just twist and warp our input file to match that. 
And those two different approaches really result in two different types of correction that I think it's important to get the terminology straight on. When we're just using our image and linking that to ground um, GPS locations, we're essentially doing a rectification. Okay, and a rectification just means that we are transforming our X and Y grid system into another grid system that actually has geographic units associated with it. So we're essentially turning our map from having a cell address of pixel 1, um, column 1, row 1, right, that would be its address would be 1, 1 for row number and column number, into coordinates such as lat long, right, so that's really rectification is just turning that from an XY grid system into a geographic uh, coordinate system. And in doing that, we're also hoping to make this geometry planimetric, or in other words, we're trying to remove those distortions that we talked about that might be coming um, from the detector or the curvature of the earth or the topography or the view angle. And in this process, we're essentially changing our image, our raw image file, into what we can now call a map. So we don't refer to an image as a map until we know it has projection information associated with it. Now, on the other hand, if we are doing the image-to-image -image geocorrection, in addition to accomplishing all of this, because the image-to-image -image geocorrection also does all of this, but it's also aligning two or more images. It's, it's basically saying that I'm going to make sure that my original image is going to line up with this other image, and they're both going to be now turned into maps. And we're basically making sure that we can overlay these two images. And then remember there was that additional option to bring a digital elevation model with topography into our correction process so that we can now not only um, have our planimetric distortions removed and have uh, geographic coordinates, but we can also now do an ortho rectification where we are correcting for those terrain displacements that occur in mountainous regions. And this really is the gold standard, at least for us here. I suppose if we were in Florida or somewhere else very flat, it might not make a difference, but certainly in any mountainous regions, making sure that you have an ortho rectification in addition to your geo registration um, is really useful. Think about it, it's kind of ironic that the only way we can remove these distortions from our image is by distorting our image and it's those ground control points that are going to tell the software how to pull, imagine this is silly putty, how do I squish or pull or lengthen or stretch um, these pixels so that it represents truly the area on the ground instead of just being the square. So we'll pause there and let sort of the concepts of uh, geometric distortions sink in and then in our next video we'll get into some of the different steps we have to go through to correct our imagery and some of the options that we have to choose from. Until the next video.